Hello and welcome to Shredder Zoo. Today we're taking a look at probably the most famous dinosaur of all, the Tyrannosaurus. The first specimen recognised as Tyrannosaurus was discovered by Barnum Brown in 1902. It was named by Henry Fairfield Osborne in 1905. I say recognised as Tyrannosaurus as it was not actually the first discovered. Back in 1892, Edward Drinker Cope found two incomplete vertebrae that he recognised as belonging to a new species. He believed they belonged to a new species of ceratopsian dinosaur and named the species Manospondylus gigas. Today, naming a new species on such incomplete remains would only be done after very careful consideration by the researchers. But Cope named it during the Bone Wars, the period of time when Cope and O.C. Marsh were in a race to name the most new species. In a 1917 paper, Osborne discussed many dinosaurs but also noted the similarity between the vertebrae of Tyrannosaurus and Manospondylus. Despite these similarities being pointed out, nothing further happened until the turn of the following century. In the year 2000, the Black Hills Institute of Geological Research found what is believed to be the original fossil site for Manospondylus gigas. There, the dig crew recovered further Tyrannosaurus remains confirming that the Manospondylus remains did indeed belong to Tyrannosaurus. This presented immediate upset not just in the paleontological community, but in news reports around the world. Typically under ICZN rules, the first name has priority over any subsequent names that are given to the same genus. In this scenario, Tyrannosaurus would only exist as a synonym, and all fossils and future references to Tyrannosaurus would have to say Manospondylus instead. However, a revision to ICZN rules that happened a little earlier in 2000 may actually preserve the name Tyrannosaurus. The simplest version of these revisions come across as any junior synonym, in this case Tyrannosaurus, that has been used as the accepted name for species instead of the senior name, in this case Manospondylus, that was granted before 1899, may be used as the official name for that taxon. This means that Tyrannosaurus is likely going to remain known as Tyrannosaurus because of so many studies published by so many paleontologists referring to it as Tyrannosaurus. In contrast, Manospondylus is virtually unknown if you don't count the very scant references to its similarity with Tyrannosaurus, and as such will become treated in a similar manner to any other synonym to Tyrannosaurus. So what was Tyrannosaurus like as an animal? Although dinosaurs like the Giganotosaurus and Spinosaurus have claimed the crown of largest carnivore from the Tyrannosaurus, it was still the biggest carnivore found in North America, where it roamed during the Cretaceous. The largest individual so far discovered, and the most complete at 85%, was a skeleton nicknamed Sue after its discoverer. This individual measures a total length of 12.3 metres. A point worth mentioning that applies to all dinosaur finds when it comes to the larger size estimates is that it's incredibly improbable that the largest ever dinosaur of a particular species would become fossilised, and even more unlikely that scientists would actually find it as well. Therefore, it is very likely that dinosaurs could grow bigger than the biggest fossils we have found. However, in science, the estimates must be based on material actually found, or it's just speculation. For example, a skull of Tyrannosaurus has been found that is 6% bigger than Sue, but as its body has not been found, its total length cannot be given with absolute certainty. Another interesting thing about Sue is that it was 28 years old at the time of death. This is considered old for Tyrannosaurus, whose lifespans are considered to be around 30 years. Many juvenile specimens of Tyrannosaurus at different ages have been found, allowing researchers to document the growth cycle throughout the life of the dinosaur. The smallest individual ever found was just two years old, and would have weighed around 30 kilograms, whereas Sue is estimated as weighing around 5,650 kilograms. A Tyrannosaurus's growth curve is S-shaped, with juveniles remaining under 1,800 kilograms until approximately 14 years of age when body size began to increase dramatically. During this rapid growth phase, a young Tyrannosaurus rex would gain an average of 600 kilograms, that's about 1,300 pounds a year, for the next four years. At 18 years of age, the curve plateaus again, indicating that growth slowed dramatically. Now, I've mentioned Sue quite a bit so far, but it must be remembered that the nickname was given in honour of Sue Hendrickson, who discovered the fossil, and not because it's believed the animal was female. 
In fact, it's very difficult to determine the sex of Tyrannosaurus. It's been noted that there are two distinct body types, or morphs, similar to some other theropod species. As one of these morphs was more solidly built, it was termed the robust morph, while the other was termed gracile. It was assumed that the robust morph was female. The pelvis of several robust specimens seemed to be wider, perhaps allowing the passage of eggs. It was also thought that the robust specimens showed a reduced chevron on the first tail vertebrae, which could also allow eggs to pass out of the reproductive tract. This feature had been reported in crocodiles. However, in 2005, a study on crocodiles discovered that the chevron anatomy was not sexually dimorphic, and so cast doubt on the use of this feature for identifying the sex of Tyrannosaurus. Sue was also an extremely robust individual, but had a full-sized chevron, indicating that this feature could not be used to differentiate the two morphs anyway. To date, there has only been one individual that has been proven to be female, and this is because of the presence of what is called medullary tissue in the fossilised remains. In birds, this tissue is a kind of calcium reserve that is used for the production of eggshells during ovulation. Because it is used for this process, it obviously only occurs naturally in female birds, and by extension could only exist in a female tyrannosaurus. The problem is, the absence of medullary tissue does not prove the animal was male. This tissue is only present during ovulation, so if a female died and was preserved while not ovulating, the medullary tissue would not be present. So what about the outside of the tyrannosaurus? What does it look like? Well, the first thing we should address is the issue of feathers. Most reconstructions of Tyrannosaurus show it as a grey, scaly, lizard-like animal. But with more recent discoveries of feathered Tyrannosaurs like Dilong and Euteranus, the debate over feathered Tyrannosaurus has increased. It seemed likely that Tyrannosaurus had feathers, even if they were only simple filaments. It was once suggested that only juvenile Tyrannosaurs had feathers, and lost them to become adults. The reason being that larger animals would overheat if insulated. This is one of the reasons elephants and rhinos are mostly hairless. But a large tyrannosaur like Euteranus has given us different ideas. Interestingly, it has been suggested that feathers may have insulated smaller animals, but could have also have kept the larger animals cool. While normally a densely packed layer of feathers would trap air and keep the heat close to the body, but if the feathers were more sparsely distributed across the body, they would do little to trap air and so keep in little heat. Modern feathers have a blood supply in the base. If the feathers were raised up and blood pumped through the bases, this would effectively increase the animal's surface area and allow heat to escape. Although there is no direct evidence for feathers in Tyrannosaurus, it could just be a matter of time before evidence is found. The other physical feature we should look at is the Tyrannosaurus's famously small arms. Why were they so small? Well, the Tyrannosaurus had a huge head, and it had the most powerful bite of any terrestrial animal that ever lived. With all the work of killing and feeding being done by the mouth, the arms became less useful, and evolution may have selected in favour of smaller arms that took up less resources to maintain. Despite being so small, they were incredibly strong. It's been calculated that they could lift almost 200 kilograms, that's about 440 pounds. It's been suggested that they could be used to hold struggling prey, or perhaps help the animal rise from a prone position. The last thing I want to cover today is the Tyrannosaurus's feeding strategy. Was it a predator or a scavenger? First of all, that's not a very good question. All predators will scavenge if the opportunity arises, and scavengers will kill prey if they're able to do so. So how much of the Tyrannosaurus diet was made up of killed prey compared to scavenged meals? Getting most of its food by scavenging seems unlikely. The Tyrannosaurus would be in a constant race to get to the limited food available. Smaller, faster dinosaurs would win this race more often than not, not to mention younger, faster members of its own species. But there is direct evidence for predation though. In 2013, a hadrosaur specimen was found with an injured tail. Two vertebrae had been fused together. Scans of these bones show a Tyrannosaurus tooth embedded in the centre. The bones had actually grown over it to bury it inside. Obviously the hadrosaur had survived an attack by a Tyrannosaurus. There are many examples of teeth embedded in bones or scrape marks made by Tyrannosaur teeth, but it's not always clear if these were done while the animal was alive or if inflicted post-mortem. Given the limitations to scavenging, it seems likely that Tyrannosaurus was primarily a predator. Scavenging was an option taken advantage of when possible, 
but probably did not provide the majority of its food intake. Well, there is so much more I could have told you about these incredible animals, but for today, we're out of time. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the video and you've learned something new. If you did, please let me know by leaving a comment and a like. And I hope to see you next time here at Shredder Zoo, where we'll take a look at the Giganotosaurus. Thanks for watching, and goodbye.